Uh, my name's Professor Jay Hinton. I work in the microbiology department here at TCD. Uh, and I'm going to be talking to you about this topic. Now, one way I could summarize what I'm going to tell you today is that bacteria kill a lot of people. Um, Eight million people a year. So how many people is that? Well, I could tell you that during this talk, 400 people around the world will be dying. But maybe I should back up a little bit, because many of you will never have heard of microbiology. You won't really know what microbiology is. So let me tell you a little bit about it. Um, it's a study of things that are too small to be seen with the naked eye. What are we talking about? Bacteria, viruses, fungi, algae, protozoa. You can see some, some of these beautiful pictures as, as you go around. So even fungi, which are quite big, uh, but they can also be quite small. Um, they are small, particularly bacteria, and that's what I'm going to focus on in my talk. That's why it's called microbiology. Uh, here is the head of a pin. Uh, on the pin are some bacteria. The pin is about 20 micrometers across. That's 20 microns. And here are the bacteria, which are about 5 microns long. So they're very small. Um, and here's my favorite bacteria that we work on in my lab over at the Moyne Institute, just by the cricket pitch, Salmonella typhimurium. So what sort of bacteria are associated with you? What sort of bacteria have you brought in with you today? Well, if we were to look between your toes, or you were to cough onto an agar plate, these are the sort of bacteria that would grow. Bacteria are all over you. Uh, let's see what's in your earwax. Sweaty socks. Nasal secretions. Mmm. So there are all sorts of parts of your body that contain bacteria. Um, so let's talk a bit about the friendly bacteria until we get onto the mean, nasty ones. So the friendly bacteria colonize the human gut, and they're passed from the mother to the baby during birth. Now, shall we just think about that for a moment? So the baby is in the, in the mother during gestation is essentially sterile, um, and really the mother needs to pass bacteria from the gut into the baby to help colonize the baby's gastrointestinal tract and then allow it to uh, survive infection and um, uh, break down foods. How is that going to happen? Well, if you think about it, as the mother gives birth, the head of the baby is facing backwards. And as the mother just gives that last push to get the baby out, you can imagine what else comes out with it. And the, her mouth is just there in a convenient receptacle to receive it. And it will protect humans against disease. For instance, friendly E. coli will make vitamin B7, uh, vitamin K in your gut, so the bacteria will use some food and make vitamins for you. That's handy. Uh, and also break down some indigestible carbohydrates. Uh, the results of this can be a little bit gaseous, but it's a very effective way of breaking down foods that otherwise you couldn't break down. So you're all familiar with these pots of friendly bacteria that you can get from uh, your local supermarket. And you drink them, and they go inside you, and they give you this fantastic, warm, healthy glow. Except we're not really sure how it works. So microbiologists are working very hard to understand what the bacteria are actually doing in the body that does seem to give some benefits in terms of uh, immunity. Uh, <clears throat> so how many friendly bacteria do we have inside you? Have we got any guesses around the room? Well, how about 1,000 trillion? So that's a thousand with lots and lots and lots and lots of zeros. But a thousand trillion it doesn't mean anything, does it? How about a thousand million million? Is that any better? Not really. Well, if I got them all together and put them in one place, it'd be about a kilogram. Does that help? Well, if I took a very big can of baked beans and I crammed them all in, they would just about fit into a can of baked beans. A lot of bacteria. Uh, and let's tell you about the pathogens. Um, so we moved on from friendly ones to the more dangerous ones. We get lots of different shapes. We get some spheres, we get some commas, we get some, these are called rods, uh, and spirals here. Uh, they all have interesting names, some of them, most of them are Latin names, but some of them are um, abbreviated like MRSA, one of the superbugs causing a lot of problems in hospitals now. Uh, and here's E. coli, which I'll be talking a bit more about. And you can see on the E. coli these things called flagella, which is what it uses to swim. So, this is another way of looking at bacteria. And I was wondering, how am I going to explain how small they are? And I've tried one way, but I thought I might try another way. So, these are a million times bigger 
than the real thing. So you thought I wouldn't bring any salmonella with me. Well, I haven't, but I have a couple of models. <coughs> now, I must say, I've counted these all out, and I'm going to count them all in again. Here comes E. coli. Look at these flagella. My son has one of these in his bed. <coughs> <laughs> I hope I've got no injuries. I'm not sure I did a risk assessment for that. <clears throat> so here are the bacteria in my lab. Here's E. coli. Here's a Salmonella typhi, Salmonella typhimerium. Doesn't cause quite as nasty a disease. That's Shigella, causes dysentery. Helicobacter causes ulcers. So have a little look around, look at them, pass them around, and those are a million times bigger than the real thing. So I started off with, well, it's amazing you're not dead yet. What am I talking about? Well, this is how they used to see disease, with the angel of death coming along and scything down the population. Uh, well, you probably know life expectancy is a lot longer now than it was. Well, have you thought about why that is? If we look at what happened in England, average age of death, uh, 1841. Now, you may not have studied these data before, but... If you were a person, or gentry, it means you were rich, average age of death in Manchester, 38. If you're in the, if you're in the countryside, 50. Uh, if you're a tradesman or a farmer, average age of death, 20. In the countryside, a lot better. If you're a labourer, a servant, at the bottom of the pile, average age of death, 17. In the countryside, you're lucky you'd live to 33. What does that mean? Well, if this was 1840, lots of you wouldn't be here at all. Lots of your parents certainly would be dead. So things have changed, because uh, now life expectancy has gone up. We're, we're getting up towards the 70s, 80s now. Uh, well, let's see what happened. So in the early 1900s, this is data from the States, we've got life expectancy starting at 45 and starting to go up. Oh, something bad happened here. That was a um, Spanish flu pandemic in 1918. Uh, and that was a, a real problem, killing... Uh, huge numbers of people. In fact, in killing more people than the whole of the First World War. There are some people at the back. Do come down. It would be easier than getting stuck. There's some places. I'm sure people will shuffle in a bit and let you in. Yeah, so Spanish flu was very bad. Uh, but then the, the inexorable rise of life expectancy, World War II didn't really have much effect. And then up and up and up. Even things like HIV and AIDS and things like SARS and things like bird flu. And here we are, and our life expectancy is still increasing. So what was killing everybody in 1840? Well, we, got, we haven't got very da good data for that, but we have got it from 1900 in the States. And what was killing people was diphtheria, diarrheal disease, tuberculosis, pneumonia. And there's also quite a lot of uh, accidental death, so people just... Uh, getting injured and dying of their injuries. So that's 1900. And what happened in 1998? Well, all of these, apart from pneumonia, have disappeared. So diphtheria, diarrheal disease, pneumonia, in the state, uh, TB in the States are no longer a problem. Uh, and just pneumonia, which is a, a common killer still for uh, old people. So there's a huge difference, isn't there? So why are these diseases like diphtheria, like um, TB, no longer such a threat in developed countries. Well, basically, because microbiologists work very hard, we put our bacteria under the microscope and we discovered the causal agents. We discovered what was causing these disease. So, for instance, smallpox is caused by the variella virus. We know a lot about it. Cholera is caused by Vibrio cholera. Typhoid is caused by Salmonella typhi. That's the red one. But it's not, it's not contagious. You can handle it without fear. Um, we also found how to combat them, thankfully. So, smallpox, vaccination. I'm not going to talk much about vaccination today except to say that it saved millions and millions of lives. Uh, and it still is one of the most effective ways of treating disease. In 1980, smallpox was eradicated. The, the treatment developed by microbiologists was so effective that uh, smallpox is no longer a problem. Cholera, well, it's a, different, it's a different way of solving the problem. Sanitation. Basically, you need to separate humans from human waste, from feces. Uh, that's the, ba the basic problem. I'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, and then typhoid is a mixture. You can vaccinate against typhoid, and also you need to improve sewerage, and that works very well. And uh, there are one or two more prosaic uh, aspects of um, stopping yourself getting disease. Hygiene. This was largely developed in Germany in the 1800s. The basic idea of washing your hands. So if you do wash your hands regularly, 
you will get 50% less colds than people who don't. And if you can avoid picking your nose and sucking your finger, it'll, even, it'll be even better. So uh, these things, these very small practical things, can protect you against these um, dangerous infective agents. So let's get back to cholera. This is how it was seen in 1915. Um, and it's still in the headlines, isn't it? Been causing a lot. Do come down, do come down. It's not worth staying up there. There is some space. People will let you in. Um, and in Haiti, there have been a lot of deaths due to cholera. Uh, if we look at what, where cholera is around the world, you can see largely it's in developing countries where they haven't got such good sanitation systems. They haven't got as much... Their economy is not as... Uh, I'm not going to talk about the economy. <coughs> so, if we think about how you treat people with cholera, um, here we have a cholera bed, and here we have a poor patient. Um, cholera causes severe diarrhoea. Now, I, it's not very pleasant to think about it, but 19 litres a day, that's more than 40 pints. So you see why these beds are essentially a plastic sheet and a hole in the middle and a bucket underneath. Uh, not very pleasant, uh, but the bacteria on their own won't kill you. What will kill you is dehydration. So if you have cholera and you're in Dublin, you'll be fine. You're going to hospital, intravenous drip, no problem. They'll replace all the fluids and within a couple of weeks, you'll be better. Uh, however, uh, if you're in a country where they can't afford such good health care, they'll be trying to give you fluids to drink, but it's very difficult to replace 40 pints of water in a day, particularly if you're ill. <clears throat> That's where the deaths come from. And if we think about what's happening in Haiti nowadays, where people are living in shacks and tents, um, and they've got to walk a long way to get water, so they, can't have, they don't have a ready source of water, and often it's not coming straight out of a tap, the question is, how do they boil it? So cholera is a bacterium. It's obvious how you stop getting cholera. You boil the water. But look around here. Do you see any trees? How do people make fires to boil water? So just the basic things of sanitation and uh, looking after yourself when there isn't much money around can be very difficult. But there was one interesting um, microbial fact that came very useful here. Uh, cholera bacteria stink, stick to plankton. What does that mean? So, here are some plankton, very small protozoa that um, swim around in water, and they live in water that people like to drink. Uh, and cholera bacteria like to stick onto them. Now, actually, the cholera bacteria are a lot smaller, and uh, they're living in the drinking water. The bacteria are actually... Well, actually, they couldn't see the bacteria because they're a lot, lot smaller. So all you have to imagine is that that um, uh, protozoan will have about 1,000 or even 10,000 cholera bacteria sticking to it outside. So it's a wonderful way of getting around in water, uh, but thankfully most of the bacteria are stuck onto these protozoa. So, somebody came up with a new idea of getting rid of cholera by filtering through a sari, uh, this type of cloth. Uh, and they did the fantastic title of a paper um, in 2003. Here's a picture of a sari under the EM. Uh, apparently old saris are better than new saris because the fibres have matted together. And you make four layers of this sari material and uh, here's a picture of somebody filtering the water. Oops. And, and you can see that um, it's very, very straightforward. You take your water from whatever source, you filter it through, and, well, the question is, do you get less cholera? Uh, and here you can see uh, the control group who didn't filter the water, and the, sa the people who filter water through sari, they reduce the amount of cholera by half. So just by understanding the microbiology of a situation, you can start to reduce the amount of disease that's being caused. Um, so, I have to come on to my, my next question. Well, bacteria can do these clever things. They can stick onto um, protozoa, they can stick onto plants, they can stick onto all sorts of surfaces inside your body. I'm going to talk about the gut wall in a moment. So, are these bacteria intelligent? Well, let's look at them uh, swimming across the surface, shall we? I'll just sort this out. Right, what you have to imagine is the bacteria on the left are swimming across the surface in an ine inexorable way. And they're swimming from left to right, attracted by some nutrients that are around here. Uh, and they are doing this powered by flagella. Um, so here's the bacterium again with some nice flagella on its outside. And on the ones I threw out, you can see the flagella, uh, these long threads. Uh, and these are the um, flagella apparatus. We know all sorts about them. We know about the proteins that are involved, and we know exactly how they work. And, um, 
And on my PC, they rotate really beautifully, showing that that's actually the rotating action of the flagellum is what makes the bacteria swim. Uh, so let's think more about why the bacteria might do this. And let's think about your gastrointestinal tract. So uh, here you are. Um, it's looking very nice, isn't it? We can look at some of these uh, bits of your gut that we uh, know and love. Here's your small intestine. That's where uh, large numbers of uh, bacteria live, your large intestine going down the back. Um, and so you have imagination is getting very good now, isn't it? These bacteria are swimming across the surface towards here. And you imagine that this is your gut wall. The bacteria are able to sense where your gut wall is. They go in in food, they can detect where the gut wall is, they can swim towards it, and then they are able to invade the gut cells and so cause diarrhea. So are they intelligent? Well, they certainly have evolved um, closely with mammals over the last 200 million years. And because of that, they've become very resourceful. They have many interesting abilities, such as growing inside us and causing disease. So what I'm going to do now is tell you a bit about what Salmonella has done. So Salmonella is one of the most cunning pathogens that lives in your gut. Uh, gets in your gut and is able to do this tropism towards the cell wall and then it can invade those cells. And I want to show you what that looks like. Uh, we've got a great animation that was made by the Howard Hughes Foundation in the States. So, if I can find it. Uh, at this point. So what you're going to see is you've got some salmonella, a salmonella bacterium is going to come in here and on this bottom surface is going to be um, an epithelial cell, a human epithelial cell, such as lines the gut wall. So let's see what happens. So here's the salmonella, finding somewhere to stop and it finds somewhere to put itself and it starts injecting proteins. These proteins go into the cell and they force the cell to start taking up the salmonella. So it literally hijacks your gut cell. And then in comes the salmonella. This is the skeleton of the cell. Here's the salmonella. And it's uh, in this sort of vacuole, this bubble, if you like. And it starts being attacked. Your cells attack it, trying to kill the bacteria. And the bacteria can tell that they're coming under attack, and it's dangerous. And then we have the Star Wars moment, where they start to produce more proteins that cover this bubble and then protect the bacteria, stop them being uh, killed by your defense systems, then the bacteria just start growing quite happily in this bubble which is coated with their proteins and all these defenses from your body cannot get into this bubble and suddenly the bacteria are in a fantastic place where they can just grow and grow and grow, completely protected from the immune system, completely, the body is completely unable to touch them. And then later on you see these huge numbers of bacteria which then can move around the body. So, uh, uh, how do we know that? We know that because we've been doing very detailed studies over the past 20 years about what the bacteria can do. We've been studying the genes that the bacterium needs to get inside the cells, to grow inside the cells, to do that Star Wars-like thing. Uh, we've been studying the host. We've been studying the host to see how the host is reacting to the bacteria. And we've been putting together a picture of how salmonella interacts with the immune system, what the bacteria have to do, what the immune system has to do. So salmonella is, is the best host to pathogen uh, interaction in terms of our understanding. Now, if I have to go back to my slides. So we understand a lot about what the bacteria do. We understand much about how they cause disease. Uh, but we're still having a huge problems. We're still having a, a lot of impact upon humans from these bacteria. Now, you, we all hope that these bacteria will respond to treatment. And uh, certainly, there was times when antibiotics were produced at the beginning where they were fantastic. They really saved millions and millions of lives. But we do have problems. And uh, you'll all, I won't go labor this point, but you've all heard about uh, antibiotic resistance. You've all heard about superbugs. It's a great way of selling newspapers, apparently. Uh, and this is where we are now. We need a new generation of microbiologists to help us cope with some of the diseases that we have not yet been clever enough to fight. 
Uh, we need to understand the basic mechanisms of disease so that we can then find ways of subverting them. We can find different types of antibiotics. We need completely new types of antibiotics and also new types of vaccines. Otherwise, how will we protect ourselves against the attack of the killer bacteria? So I'd encourage you to go to the microbiology stand. And uh, I've got a leaflet here. Ah, where will I find it? Which um, is worth going to pick up. This will give you an impression about what microbiologists can do afterwards. Of course, there's more to it than just making antibiotics. There are many interesting places you can work in labs. You can do research in labs. You can go into teaching. <coughs> and uh, just at the end, I have to say, it's time for the bacteria to go back to the lab um, to be used to do some more experiments. And uh, I'm now looking, oh, and this is the lab. Here we are. This is the Moyen Institute across by the cricket pitch. Um, here's my lab, uh, some of the people from my lab. And this is uh, one of the best microbiology departments in the world. And here are the bacteria. So I'm looking for five bacteria, if I could have them back. If you hit me, you get a bonus point. <laughs> oh. <laughs> You're welcome to pass them down if you don't want to throw them down. Thank you. There's one. I saw one there. There's one coming back. That's good. There's two, three, four. That's good. <clears throat> Excellent. If you could uh, pick them up and get them down the front, that's great. Well, nobody's hit me yet. It's a big disappointment. <laughs> so that's me done. Thanks very much. <laughs>